Kuki, Nitaniku Enkiki. Hello, welcome. My name is Grant Manyheads, and I'm one of the interpreters here at Blackfoot Crossing Historical Park. And today we're going to be talking about Blackfoot history, in particular the years 1870 to 1874. So actually, before we get started, let me uh, let you know what my Blackfoot name means. Enkiki means singer. So that's what my name means in English. So let's move on to the first slide here. Now this is Niitawasi. So basically that's our name for our land. Niitawasinani basically means that we are the people of the land of the buffalo. And in our language we say ini when we speak of this particular animal. The bison, North American bison are what they call the, mistakenly call the buffalo. In Blackfoot, we call this animal Eni. So wherever the great northern herds of Eni roamed, our people followed. So our territory was defined by the buffalo. So Eni, the buffalo, was our staff of life. It provided the Siksigeitsitapi, or the Blackfoot speaking people, with food, clothing, shelter, and it also had hundreds of uses to the Blackfoot either for making tools, weapons, or any number of different uh, uses for this animal. So as I mentioned, wherever Eni roamed, the Blackfoot followed. When we look at this next image, Niitawasi, as I mentioned, is our name for our land. Well, our ancient stories tell us that this territory was given to us by Itzabeta Biop, or the Creator. Uh, the essence of life. So as far as the Blackfoot believed, we've always believed that this area that you see on the map was territory basically given to us by the Creator for our survival and for our, uh, for our health, for our resources. So this is what we call home. And you know what's interesting is the Blackfoot have no migration stories. So we've always felt that we've been here in this part of the land that we live on. So these same stories tell us that Eni, or the buffalo, was created as a gift for our people, as I mentioned. So there's many sacred sites throughout the territory that are reflected in our stories. Places such as um, the Crow's Nest Mountain and the Crow's Nest Pass, as an example, or even uh, Chief Mountain, which is just on the, kind of on the international border. Well, all of these different places that have significance to the Blackfoot all have stories in, in our, uh, our ancient stories amongst our people. So the Blackfoot lived by hunting four-footed game, and our mainstay was Eni, the buffalo. But we also hunted other animals, like the elk. And in our language, we call the elk Bonoka. And so our people knew where uh, the best places to find these animals, these kill sites, and we would return to them every year to see if these uh, same animals are in these different places. So. The elk was one of the animals that we hunted. And you know what's unique about the Blackfoot people is that we had a certain diet. We didn't just eat anything that was on the plains. Basically, we ate what was uh, clean, considered clean food. You know, there's almost a parallel there between the Bible and the Blackfoot people. In the Bible, in the Mosaic Law, the Israelites had a certain diet. They could only eat certain things. They weren't allowed to eat anything uh, that swarms or like... Uh, swine or pigs. Well, the Blackfoot were kind of similar in a sense because the only animals that we ate were four-footed animals that ate the grass and had a split hoof. Uh, we didn't eat anything with paws, anything with claws, bears, dogs. None of these things were part of our diet. That's not to say that our people didn't eat some of these things in times of starvation. But other than that, our people did not eat these um, other types of animals. In fact, uh, things like fish were considered taboo. Same with uh, a lot of birds, waterfowl, prairie chickens, things like this, even though these would provide sustenance for a lot of people, the Blackfoot simply did not eat these things. So like there was an abundance of buffalo back then, so that was our mainstay, as I mentioned. But we did eat other animals, such as the elk, bonoka. If we move on to the next image, you can see the two types of deer that they have on their prairies, it's particularly in the Alberta region. And these are the mule deer and white-tailed deer. But to us, they're awakas. So these deer were a part of our 
diet, but also we use mostly deer skins for our clothing, for our day-to-day -day wear, because the hides are a lot softer and not as heavy as a buffalo hide, so we could wear these things comfortably. Move the next image, we see the antelope and the mountain goats. Well, these are also animals that we hunted. And from the stories is that every batch, or not bachelor, every young married man would give as a gift to his new wife, uh, mountain goat fleece, because that's one of the softest things you could lie on. So these were, um, and the, also you could use the horns of these animals to make ladles and spoons. So these are some of the animals that the Blackfoot hunted as well as the buffalo, the antelope and mountain goats. And then we move on to the moose and the bighorn sheep. Same thing where we use these animals for, uh, for our diet, for meat, but also we would use things like the horns, as I mentioned, for ladles and for soup or for even decoration. So these are the animals that the Blackfoot hunted in our territory, but also uh, we knew where to find foods. And basic, basically the, the prairies are covered with berries. I mean, we'd have bucky, our choke cherries, our uchkanuki, the Saskatoons, uh, bullberries, as we see on this next page. These are all part of the pemmican. These are all part of the dried food that we put into parfleche bags that would sustain our people over the winter months. And so we would collect these berries and put it with this meat, meat and this mixture was highly nutritious. And this is basically something that the Blackfoot people lived on. And in fact, the pemmican, as they called it, the meat and the berries mixed together, stuffed into a parfleche bag. These became a big item of trade between the Blackfoot and the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company, because they learned that it's easier for them to have a bag of parfleche when they're uh, canoeing up and down the North Saskatchewan River, instead of having to carry hundreds of pounds of supplies to get from one place and carry it all the way back down river while they realized it was a lot easier just to have a bag of pemmican and this would sustain them for the entire trip and it only weighed like 50 pounds and you could stash it behind you in the canoe. So these became huge items of trade because of, uh, because of this. And these were the plants that we used to make that uh, pemmican. So also you see their lodgepole pine. Well, when we got the horse and our teepees became bigger, compared to the dog days. Well, the lodgepole pine was the only uh, source of wood that was straight enough and that was strong enough to be able to create the teepees that you see today. Some of them are 20 foot to 30 foot teepees. And so they required uh, 30, 30 foot to 40 foot high teepee poles. Well, we would go, we would know where to find these. You could find the lodgepole pine along the foothills of the mountains, of course, but the only other place you could find it was in Blackfoot territory was the Cypress Hills. And the Cypress Hills was one of those few places that actually grew lodgepole pine. So our people knew where to find the four-footed animals and where to find the food that we needed to uh, survive. Now, if you look at this next image, this is a picture of one camp, one tribe of Blackfoot, possibly 30 to 40 teepees in this particular tribe. But this is their movements over the course of one year. And in that one year, they picked up and moved about 15 times. So you could see at the beginning where they left and they made their way towards the Cypress Hills. And then they kind of stayed in that area. And what they were doing was every place that they went, they were either collecting berries or they were hunting buffalo or they were collecting lodgepole pine or they were going out into uh, the prairie area there to pick up whatever things they may need along the Milk River, up along the uh, Bull's Head near the Cypress Hills. Well, if you look at that picture there, there's a little inset. So you see that this picture is actually just a small part of the Blackfoot territory. But this is the movements of one tribe within one year. And by moving camp frequently, we were able to de avoid depleting the resources in one particular area. So every year after, we could come back and enjoy those same resources. So as Blackfoot, we were called nomadic and pedestrian. Well, basically those are big words meaning we were on foot and we wandered all over our lands, but we traveled with purpose. We always traveled with purpose. Uh, if we broke camp, we wouldn't simply just um, blindly move maybe five, 10 miles away from where we were camped. We always had a place where we were going for a reason. Like I mentioned, it was either because of a good kill site or because we needed to collect different resources, medicines, plants, and in different areas where they grew, where we knew they grew. This is why we would go to these different areas. And so this image here just kind of basically shows you that. And I just like to point out, this is just one 
one tribe, one uh, band. Uh, amongst the six you got, there are at least 38 back in these days, 1830s, 1840s. 38 different bands, and that's just one tribe. And they still have the Gena and the Pigani, who were more numerous in the Siksika. So you can imagine how many bands were all over our territory. It would have been filled with people, different camps on different rivers, and everybody going for different resources, are the same resources. So there could be uh, as much as maybe three or four bands in that one particular area. But that's just the one band's movements over the course of a year. So if we look at the next image, while one of the other reasons that our people moved throughout our territory was to prevent neighboring tribes from encroaching on our lands. Now the Blackfoot people were very jealous of our lands when it came to hunting because as I mentioned, we felt that this was land given to us by Creator. So wherever the buffalo went, we followed. And if you look at the map there, that was the extent of the Blackfoot territory. But on all sides of us were other tribes and some of them were not so friendly as others. Now. Uh, yeah, so our people moved throughout our territory to make sure that no other tribe got a hold on our territory. And in history, this kind of happened a few times there when uh, the Blackfoot moved north to escape the smallpox. When they moved back south to our southern borders, our southern lands, there are already tribes that are moving up into that area because we had left those areas because of the smallpox. And so what that basically caused was an intertribal warfare where our people in order to take over back our lands, our southern lands, we end up having to drive those tribes back across the Yellowstone. And that time that happened to be the Shoshone and the Crow, who were enemies with the Blackfoot in those days. So that's just an example. Our people moved throughout our lands to protect them. So if we look at this next image, you can see everybody here is on foot. And this is the dog days, obviously, because you can see the dog with the travois, and they're carrying the people's goods across the land. Well, from time immemorial, which is basically a big word meaning into the distant unknown past. Well, our Blackfoot people knew every detail of this land because our people traveled constantly through it. And first on foot, and on foot you wouldn't miss too many things, there'd be a lot of details. So our people over the years got to know all of these different uh, areas of our land and what was the easiest way to get from one river to another or what was the easiest way to get from one point to the other. Well, our people understood this after walking through our lands. And then over the years, that changed to horses. So later our, our, with horses, we traveled the extent and breadth of our lands. So our trails were well marked across the grasslands. All throughout our territory, there was trails that we knew would take you from one place to the other the quickest. So our people got to know our lands intimately. If we look at the next image here, you could see the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, Blackfoot speaking peoples, and it's pretty vast. If you look at it, that's a huge area. That's bigger than most states in the United States of America. Well, our traditional territory, it extended from the North Saskatchewan River, where you could see at the top there, uh, Edmonton and Prince Albert, and then from there all the way south to the Yellowstone River, where you see those cities of Butte and Bozeman and Helena. Well, these places, this was, uh, these are cities along the Yellowstone River. So that's uh, quite a distance between the North Saskatchewan and the Yellowstone. And this was our northern and southern, basically, boundaries. And then from the backbone of the world are the Rocky Mountains, as we call them today. Well, from the backbone of the world, all the way out to the Touchwood Hills and Capel Valley, Blackfoot stories tell us that we lived in these places and these were part of our traditional territory. You know, and what's interesting too is just to let you know, even though where it's marked off here, this was our traditional Blackfoot territory where our people lived. The Blackfoot people were found all the way down to Santa Fe in Taos, New Mexico. If you look at the historical record, Bent's Fort on the Platte River or the Arkansas, there was Blackfoot there as far as the 1830s, up to 500 teepees of Blackfoot down that far down south. So this was our traditional territory where we lived and hunted the buffalo. But the Blackfoot followed the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains all the way down practically into Mexico. And these lands were known to us. They were known to the Blackfoot. So that tells you a lot about how the native tribes traveled this land long before there was any Europeans or any settlers that came this way. We already knew our trails. We already knew where we were going. And we knew who our neighbors were. So that's an interesting note just to pass that on to you. So if we look at the next image, 
You see another picture of the Blackfoot Territory. And as I mentioned, our people believe that this territory and all the resources in it had been given to us as a gift by Apostadoki, or the creator, for our specific use. So as I mentioned, other tribes were welcome to visit and trade, but not to take our game and our resources without permission. That only caused problems. Now, over the centuries, the different bands among our people, they developed the habit of living in different parts of our territory. And you can see that with this map here. Over here, you can kind of see where the Siksika were. And this is between the two Saskatchewan rivers and kind of up near uh, Prince Albert, up in this area here. Well, this is where the Siksika traditionally lived. We lived in the North Saskatchewan, the Battle River, and different places here. And then in the middle towards us where we kind of are now in the, in the Blackwood Crossing, at one time this would have been mostly camped by Gaina, the, the blood tribe. So the Gaina while we're in this area, kind of in the middle, and then towards the mountains and the foothills with the Pikani. So our people lived, and if you can see right be, beside the Pikani, there's what we call the Atsina. And these are the Groven, who are allies of the Blackfoot people in those days, before 1861 anyway. So over the centuries, as I mentioned, the different bands among our people developed the habit of living in different parts of our territory. So if we look at this next image, you could see, and this would have been about circa 1830, 1840, this particular map and the Blackfoot, uh, how we kind of went back from the Saskatchewan into Alberta. And this was uh, because of our population loss. We lost so many Blackfoot people, or so, so many Siksikaitsi Tapiks, our Blackfoot-speaking people, that by the time 1840 came, we may have been half of what we originally were, or maybe even a third of what we originally were, as far as population goes. So you could see that in this image, how the Blackfoot territory, well, basically not the Blackfoot territory, Blackfoot territory remained as it is, but the Blackfoot population receded somewhat. So in this picture, you can see that the Siksika were usually found along the northern and eastern part of our territory. And the Gaina lived in the central part, with the Pikani camped in the mountains and along the foothills to the west. There was another group back then they called the Anuxics, or the small robes. And they lived in the mountains and on the west slope of the mountains near the Bitterroot Valley. So this was the extent of the Blackfoot tribes and and uh, the land that they controlled in those days. So if we look at this next image, this is actually the present day Blackfoot speaking tribes, the Siksika Tapi. In the top there, you can see Siksika, then below them, you could see a Gaina, or the Gaina, and then you could see the two Bikani tribes. They're split into two. Um, Skapi Bikani are those uh, Bikani that live in the United States of America. And the Bikani at the top represent those Bikani that live in Canada near Pincher Creek and near Brockett. So these four tribes make up the Blackfoot speaking people today. And uh, this is what they call the Blackfoot Confederacy. But true to life, the, the more accurate term is Siksikaitsitapi, because that means Blackfoot speaking people. So these are the tribes that exist today. And if we go to the next image, we can actually start our history lesson here today. So we're looking at the year 1870. Now, if we look at that first image, we're looking at the smallpox. So this smallpox actually started in October of 1869, so a few months before 1870. And this smallpox actually originated on a Missouri steamboat, like the first one did, and probably the uh, first and second ones did, in 1865 and in, sorry, 1765 and 1836 were two smallpox epidemics that hit the Blackfoot people. This one was the third one, the third smallpox that hit us in 1870. And this smallpox epidemic basically wiped out one third of the Blackfoot speaking peoples on the continent at that time. So that was a lot of people. We really don't have a figure on how many people actually died. But if you could think of a, 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 maybe your family or some huge group, to have one third of them already gone, that was a lot of people. And in those days, those were chiefs. These were medicine people. These were important people that the other sick people went to visit to see while they were sick and they end up getting sick and dying. So this disease, basically, this epidemic wiped out, as I mentioned, one third of the Blackfoot speaking peoples. Now at this time, when this smallpox went through the Blackfoot tribes, it killed a lot of, as I mentioned, important people. While to the Bloods or the Gainawa, their head chief, seen from afar in Bullbreast, both died in 1870 from this disease. And amongst the Siksika, 
our chief three sons, he died from this disease in 1870. And because of his death, his followers in the Biters Band end up joining Crowfoot, Big Pipes Band. So, oh, let's actually move to the next image. So, because of this, Crowfoot became one of three head chiefs of the Siksika. The other two were Head Chief Old Swan, Head Chief Big Swan, or actually, let me correct myself, Head Chief Old Sun, Head Chief Old Sun, Head Chief Big Swan, and then Head Chief Crowfoot. So traditionally, the Blackfoot always had three head chiefs up until the signing of the treaty when we only had two. And this was because of the smallpox epidemic and starvation and a lot of other things that pretty much killed a lot of Blackfoot people, thousands literally in those days. So Crowfoot's band became known as the Moccasin Band. And he became, as I mentioned, one of three head chiefs of the Blackfoot. And this was in 1870. Now, at the beginning of 1870, there was an event that kind of uh, changed the Blackfoot attitude towards the Americans. Now, in, 18, Gen in January of 1870, soldiers under the leadership of Colonel E.M. Baker basically raided a Blackfoot village, a peaceful Blackfoot camp, and they killed over 217 peaceful Blackfoot men, women, and children on the Marias River in Montana. Now, this was a mistake because Colonel Baker was actually looking for Chief Mountain Chief's band, of which they had warrants to arrest a few of the Braves as because they were, in their mind, they were murderers because of some events that went down. So Colonel Baker was actually, our Major Baker was actually looking for Mountain Chief's camp. Well, his scouts led him to another camp, Chief Heavy Runner's camp. Now, Chief Heavy Runner's camp was a sick camp. Basically, it was a mixed camp. And what he did was he took in sick people from different bands and he took care of them, excuse me, in his own camp. And all the healthy young men and the hunters and the able-bodied warriors were all out hunting for this camp. So there was no warriors, no able-bodied warriors in this camp when Colonel Baker attacked it in the early morning hours. So he ended up wiping out, as I mentioned, a bunch of men, women and children. And it was a sick camp. All these people all had the smallpox. And it was because of this attack on the Blackfoot that the Blackfoot felt that the United States of America was looking at wiping out our entire nation as a people. So because of this, a lot of people decided to move north of the medicine line into the Canadas or into the British possessions. So a lot of Blackfoot bands, Bikani and Dana and Siksika, and, um, they end up moving north of the medicine line. And so in 1870, all the Blackfoot tribes were basically in the British possessions, camped in the Belly River area, the Waterton area, the Waterton River, the Old Man River. There was nothing but Blackfoot camps in Southern Alberta at that time because of this action taken by the United States of America. Well, as this was going on, the smallpox epidemic that was ravaging all the Blackfoot tribes, well, the Blackfoot's enemies, those bands of the Iron Confederacy, while their chiefs, namely Piapot, Big Bear, Little Mountain, and Little Pine, they saw this as an excellent opportunity to deal a crippling blow to their foes, the Blackfoot, and subsequently expand their hunting territory and take over the, um, that land that the Blackfoot are hunting on. So they wanted to go into the Cypress Hills and basically take over those hunting grounds. And so they raised a huge war party. Now, this is kind of in response to what happened a few years earlier. And just let me kind of go over that. In 1869, one of the Cree's big time peace chiefs, his name was Maski Patoon. He was actually a well-respected chieftain and he had made peace with the Blackfoot tribes in the past. Well, at this time, he approached the Blackfoot because there was a lot of uh, back and forth fighting between the Cree and the, or actually I should say the Iron Confederacy and the Blackfoot Confederacy. There was a lot of battles going on at this time. So what ended up happening was Chief Big Swan ended up killing Chief Maskey Patoon and his peace party. And this created bad feelings between the Blackfoot and the Iron Confederacy. So what ended up happening was they went out and collected themselves, the chiefs that I so mentioned. And at this time, they raised a, a huge war party of anywhere from 600 to 
it says 800, but anywhere from 600 to 1,000 warriors all set out to attack the Blackfoot camps. So they organize themselves in the Red Ochre Hills on the South Saskatchewan River near Medicine Hat. And to this day, we really have no idea where the Red Ochre Hills are. Um, there's a lot of guesses, but no one really knows where this area is. But this is where they gathered their war party. So among the warriors were Cree, Soto, and Young Dogs, which were a Cree Assiniboine mix from the Touchwood Hills, and Assiniboine from Wood Mountain. And this war party was armed for the most part with bows and arrows, mus uh, Hudson Bay uh, muskets, and hand-to-hand -hand weapons. And at that time, they set out southeast towards Blackfoot Territory, following the South Saskatchewan River. And they wanted to fall on the first camp they could come across with this huge war party and uh, deliver a, a coup de gras or a death blow against the Blackfoot tribes at that time. Because they felt that a lot of warriors, and as I mentioned, a lot of chiefs and a lot of medicine people and uh, a lot of the leaders died during the smallpox epidemic. So the Blackfoot truly were weak weakened at that time. Well, what's that, what ends up happening is this group moves to uh, attacks 11 teepees on the north side of the Old Man River. And they didn't bother to scout out the rest of the river. And so they thought that they were falling on a small camp. And so they attacked it and they basically killed half of the people in that camp. And then some of the survivors ran across the river and alerted the Blackfoot tribes that were camped along the river. So. This, uh, this happened just before first light, and as the light starts to get brighter, then the Cree War Party realizes that there's not just a small camp here, but there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Blackfoot teepees all along these different rivers. And they actually saw waves and waves of Blackfoot riders coming in to join the battle. And then it's at this time that the Blackfoot tribes realized what a huge war party came, came to attack them. Now the thing is, as I mentioned earlier, you gotta remember that at this time, all the Blackfoot tribes are in that particular area. And at this time, there's actually a whiskey trading post, Fort Wupa or Fort Hamilton or Healy, whatever you called it, that was at the confluence of the two rivers there uh, near present day Lethbridge. Well, these people were there and all the Blackfoot tribes were trading with them. But unbeknownst to the Crees, they did not know, the Iron Confederacy did not know that there were so many Blackfoot in all, in all the rivers in that area. So when they attacked, basically the Blackfoot counterattacked and drove them. And if you look at this next image, you can actually see the actual root of the attack. Now at the top there, you can see the red dot line coming down to a circle. Well, that's where they originally came from. And then the circle is where the battle actually happened on the north side of the Old Man River. And then when the Blackfoot tribes arrived there, the different warriors, thousands and thousands of warriors. And the thing is, these warriors also had repeating rifles. So they were better armed than the attacking uh, uh, war party. Well, they drove them back and the Cree, uh, the Iron Confederacy had to run four miles across uh, Tableland until they got to the other side uh, where the Old Man River is. And from there, they tried to put up a defense, but they were actually routed. So they had to run across the river. And the whole time the Blackfoot were shooting at them with their repeating rifles. And so accounts say later that the Belly River turned red with blood from all the people who were slaughtered trying to get across. And even when they did get across, there was about 50 or more that were slaughtered on the other side of the river until Mountain Chief said that's enough and he allowed the survivors to head back to their homelands and tell the story as to what happened. So this happened in 1870. And this was the last big battle between any Plains tribes on the Canadian Plains or in Canada at that. So this was the last major battle between uh, any uh, native tribes. And this was between the Iron Confederacy and the Blackfoot Confederacy. And interesting to note, not even a year after this event, that the Blackfoot and the, and the Cree tribes or the Iron Confederacy actually made peace. And that peace stuck. And to this day, it's still stuck. There was altercations that may have happened after the 1871. But for the most part, as nations, as uh, Blackfoot and as Iron Confederacy, Cree, Assiniboine, or Soto, we basically made peace. And we haven't had war since that time. So this was the last major battle that happened in Canada as far as native tribes are concerned. See here the Battle of Belly River, these are the them trying to get across the river and you can see all the Blackfoot on the one side there, uh, basically chasing them down. So this happened in 1870. Let's move on to 1871. Well in 1871, this was a big year for uh, the whiskey trade. Now you have to remember in 1869, 
they set up the first Fort Whoop Up, which is basically a bunch of wagons kind of put together. And then they put up a few structures. And then when they left, uh, Blackfoot burned it down. So in 1870, they came back and they're using a man named Jim Gladstone, or I, I believe it's Jim Gladstone. Well, Gladstone. He's the one that actually built the second Fort Whoop Up, which was made out of cottonwood and was a uh, basically a fortress. It was basically a, a fort. So Fort Whoop Up was where they established the whiskey trade. Now, in 1871, now Fort Whoop Up is under sway. It's a center of activity. We're near present-day Lethbridge. But what ends up happening in 1870 and 1871, more and more people from Fort Benton who are actually, uh, how would you say, <clears throat> sorry, they were happy that he, um, Healy and Hamilton made $50,000 that first season they are out. So they saw that this was a money-making venture to do the same sort of thing. So the next year in 1870, 1871, there are even more people coming out for the whiskey trade, selling rot gut whiskey for uh, trade goods or for buffalo robes, I should say. So if we look at this, this image here, this is uh, one of the trading posts or whiskey posts. And this is kind of how it was. You'd come in, they'd only allow so many people to come into the store to trade their robes for blankets and for such. And this one here, I believe, was a kip. This was um, Fort Kip, a picture of Fort Kip. And this would have operated on the Old Man River at some point there, just on the other side of Lethbridge, west of there. Well, these trading posts basically sprung up all over Blackfoot country. Now, and that's because of the trade items. Now, these trade items we were getting from the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company for years. And we become dependent on them. So the thing is, it's for these reasons that when the American whiskey traders came into Blackfoot country, they came with these same goods, which we were dependent on. And this is why we, why we would allow them into our camps and why we would allow, allow them to trade with us. But more often than not, when they came into our camps, other than just trade items, they had whiskey. So it was a whiskey trade that they brought up. Now you can see this image here, the barrels and the, and the different um, containers they had in the whiskey trade. If you look at this next image too, you can see the different uh, containers as well that they brought up into the Lethbridge region or Fort Whoop Up region. And this is uh, the whiskey and the, and, and the uh, distilled products that they sold to native peoples. But I wanna point out that it wasn't whiskey that they sold to the Blackfoot people. What they sold was fire water, and fire water was different. Now, whiskey is whiskey, it's aged and everything, but fire water was basically alcohol, and they put in all sorts of substances. Every um, different group had their own recipe, but basically what they wanted to do was get that clear liquid, that alcohol, to look like whiskey. They wanted it to be amber, they wanted it to be browner. So they would put things in, such as copper or laudanum, or they would put in a chewing tobacco, bitters, all sorts of different stuff into this concoction just to get the coloring, just to get it to look like whiskey. And then they would pass this off as whiskey and sell it to the natives, but they would sell it watered down. So these people were doing everything they possibly can to make a buck, to make as much money as they could with the, with the whiskey or with the, what they had with them. So this trade actually spread right up into the British possessions from America. Now, if you look at this particular map, you can see at the top there, the different Hudson Bay Company and Northwest Company posts along the North Saskatchewan. Now at this time, alcohol or alcoholism wasn't exactly a problem because the thing is the Blackfoot would visit these posts once or twice a year. And it's possible that they got drunk for two or three days once or twice a year. But after that bender, it was back to life. They left these posts and they went back into our country and they did what we did day to day, hunting and gathering and doing these things. And then again, maybe for another six months, they wouldn't see a whiskey post. I mean, a, a, a trading fort. And then maybe, as I mentioned, then they would maybe get another taste of whiskey. Well, this is when we were trading with the Hudson Bay Company, the Northwest Company posts. Now, it was different with the Americans because with the Hudson Bay Company and Northwest Company, the Blackfoot went to them. And like I mentioned, we only saw them maybe once or twice a year. So alcoholism wasn't that big of a problem, but that's not to say that it wasn't causing problems already. In the winter counts, we know that people were murdered or killed over having the odd uh, drink 
with their friends and such. If you look at this next image, now these are the American whiskey posts. In 1869, all there was was one red dot near present-day Lathbridge. But after 1869, from 1870 up until 1874, whiskey posts sprung up everywhere. Now you can see the international border there and you can see the ones on the US side. Well, there's nothing they can do about that. That's where the natives would go to the States if they wanted to buy that type of whiskey and et cetera. But from, if you look up north of that line, all those red dots, these are all the whiskey traders that came into Southern Alberta to apply their trade. And they were actually went as far as Red Deer, just before Edmonton. And along with the whiskey trade were the wolfers, the people that the Blackfoot hated the most, the ones that poisoned the whiskey, I mean, poisoned the wolves with uh, strychnine and then end up causing the deaths of everything on the food train from eagles uh, to uh, other um, the native people's dogs, the Blackfoot dogs. These would die from the poison. So all of these places sprung up. And the problem with this was that these whiskey traders that came up into our lands, into the Blackfoot lands, they went to our camps. We didn't go to them. They came to us and they came right to the camps and they would sell their their uh, fire water. And this would cause nothing but problems for the different bands because we couldn't escape, we couldn't escape the whiskey peddlers. Wherever we camped, they followed. And so you could see that with the amount of whiskey trading posts in the British possessions uh, during that whiskey trade period from 1869 to 1874. So if we look at 1871, there's actually a few events that happened that were of of interest to the Blackfoot people, even though they directly didn't affect us at that time. Well, the one was Treaty 1 and Treaty 2. Both Treaty 1 and Treaty 2 were signed in 1871. So these are the beginning of the number of treaties that the government of Canada or the Queen's representatives were having with the different tribes on the Prairie Provinces, or, or I should say on the Plains actually. So this, this was the first and second treaty of the number of treaties. And these happened in Manitoba. And then also the British Columbia joined Confederation. British Columbia and Manitoba. So they became the next two provinces to join Canadian Confederation. But the difference between the other provinces and British Columbia was British Columbia retained control of its crown lands. And basically what that meant was they didn't want to give up any of their lands. So there was very little treaty making in BC at that time because their government simply wouldn't give up any of their lands for uh, reserve or for, for treaty. And this was a problem for a long, long time between British Columbia and the rest of Canada. Now, as I mentioned, Treaty 1, the Stone Fort Treaty with the Sodo and the Ojibwa, and this happened in Southern Manitoba. And then Treaty Number 2, the Manitoba Post Treaty, was with the Sodo and Ojibwa and Cree peoples in Central Manitoba. So both these treaties were signed in 1871. And this was like uh, six years before uh, the Blackfoot signed the treaty. Now on the American side in 1871, things were started and the American government discontinued the practice of making treaties with Indian tribes as if they were foreign countries. Because in the past, that's how they would deal with the native tribes as like foreign countries, country to country. But after this time, U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant, he issued an, an executive order and on July 5th, 1873, a couple of years after this, and it unilaterally reduced the size of the Blackfoot territory in the United States of America, and it made it that much more smaller. So this happened in 1871 and 1873. Now we're going to go to 1872. Now 1872, this is Fort Benton. This is the, basically the whiskey trade. And in 72, the whiskey trade was going as strong as ever. There was more and more uh, whiskey peddlers moving into the British possessions to sell their wares. And this is where it all stemmed from. There were two uh, people in Fort Benton who were kind of responsible for the whiskey trade because they're the ones who brought it in bulk on the steamships. And you can see there in that picture, the steamships. Uh, the thing with Fort Benton at that time, it was the farthest inland port literally thousands of miles up the Mississippi, up the Missouri, all the way to Fort Benton. And they couldn't go any further up there because of the Great Falls of the, of the Missouri. So that's as far as any ship or any boat could go inland was Fort Benton. 
So from Fort Benton, the whiskey came with the steamboats and it was delivered to the different whiskey posts by the bull trains, as you can see there. These bull trains were actually filled with a lot of trade goods, but also with a lot of fire, fire water, meaning fake whiskey. And so it was the bull trains that basically bought basically brought all of these supplies up into the Fort Whoopup region. And so you can see from here the barrels and all that sort of stuff. This was a huge industry for Fort Benton, the whiskey trade. Uh, literally all the proprietors made themselves millions of dollars because of this. So if we move, look at the next image, you can see those whiskey trading rooms again, uh, basically how most of them looked like. Let's uh, move to the next image here. So we go to 1873. Now in 1873, one of the blood uh, head chiefs, his name was Calf Shirt, and this was a very powerful blood chief. He was, he was even feared by a lot of his own people because of some of the things that he did. But he was a very, uh, very strong man, warrior. And so there's a lot of stories regarding uh, Calf Shirt. Well, in this year, he was killed by the trader, Joe Kipp, at Kipp's Fort. And apparently he got shot 16 times before he fell. And then even then, the story is that they, uh, the, the traders buried him in the river, put him in a block of ice. His wives were the ones that actually found him. And the story is that they brought in a medicine man. And this medicine man, uh, these people were trying to revive him. And he wouldn't revive. And the story goes that when Crowfoot showed up with his... Uh, people he had a, a medicine person with him and this person actually went to chief calf and started to try and doctor him and he had some whiskey and he put it into chief calf's mouth and chief calf's leg moved from the fetal position and freaked everybody out because they all thought that he was coming back to life so they told him no don't do it anymore they allowed him to die and they buried him and so this is what happened to chief calf shirt but he was one of the more influential blood chiefs at that time and this is the year that he died. And this is in the winter counts as well amongst the, the Blackfoot tribes is the death of this uh, great chief of the blood tribe. So in this same year, 1873, in the winter counts, this would be the second year that it was written that the white men settled on the Highwood. So in the High River, where present day High River, just a few miles west of there was the original uh, trading post or post that these people built. And most of the people that were living in the Highwood uh, Fort, basically a whiskey fort, were wolfers. So these people were going as far as the Red Deer River and hunting wolves, poisoning them and such. And they would all meet back at the Highwood. And it was said there were as many as 300 men, no women, children, but 300 men who all kind of just stayed in that one area for protection. Because by then the Blackfoot people truly hated anybody coming from the South. They, uh, and especially the wolfers. So the wolfers basically were, had a target on their back. Wherever they moved in Blackfoot country, the Blackfoot would kill them simply because they're introducing poison into the environment. Uh, Blackfoot didn't like the idea of walking places and seeing dead eagles and dead animals that were on the food train, uh, food chain. And at that time, they had no idea how these animals were dying, but they knew it had something to do with these wolfers. So, these wolfers end up causing a lot of problems. So it wasn't just the Blackfoot, but also the Stoney and Assiniboine who would attack these wolfers when they came into the different areas there that the tribes were hunting. So in the winter, in our Blackfoot winter count, and for those of you who don't know what a winter count is, it's basically on an old buffalo rope, starting from the middle, they would have an event, the most important event according to the tribe of that year. And all other events would revolve around that one event for that year. And then the next year would be a new symbol. And then the year after another symbol until you ran out of hide. And then you would start a new one from the middle again, beginning at the end of that last one. So these are pictograph accounts of things that happened to our Blackfoot people over the years. And the oldest one we know goes back to 1765 by a man named Bull Plume. So in the Blackfoot winter counts, this is the year when the white men settled on the Highwood River. Now in 1873, there was also a few other things that happened. Now one of them was a Cypress Hills Massacre. Now we talked about the wolfers. Well, these same wolfers that were living in the Highwood region on the High River, they were originally, they were actually driven out of that position, of that place by the Blackfoot. 
So these people left and when, at the end of the trading season, they made their way back to Fort Benton and they end up going on that Teton River and they were camped there. And then overnight, their horses were stolen. The Blackfoot stole their horses. So they had to walk back to the town of Fort Benton. And when they got there, they asked the army's help to recover their horses and they were basically told no. And then they went and asked the, the law, the deputy marshal and the sheriff, and they were also re refused to help them. So these people formed their own little posse and they went to go track to find the tribe that took their horses. And when they followed these horse trails, it led them towards the Cypress Hills. But when they got to the Cypress Hills, they didn't find their horses. So they went to two trading posts that were just on each side of a creek. One was owned by a man named Abel Farwell. And this Abel Farwell was a licensed trader with the American government. And he worked for an outfit called Durfee and Peck. And so his customers were the Assiniboine that used to go on the east side of the Cypress Hills. And these are the people he would trade with. So the thing is, Abel Farwell was trading with the Assiniboines. On the other side of the river was a man named Moses Sol Solomon, who had his own trading post as well. Well, the one day when these wolfers go into the Cypress Hills and they're looking for their horses, they locate a Assiniboine tribe that were camped there. But they noticed that there was not, they didn't hardly had any horses. So these weren't the natives that stole their horses. And then they talked with Abel Farwell and Farwell told them that these natives have been here for a while and these weren't the ones that stole your horses. So basically, to quit looking at them that way. And so they did. So what they ended up doing is they went over to Moses Solomon's place and they started drinking. And then some Métis freighters joined them, coming to move their goods, and they started drinking all that day, then all that night. And by the next day, these traders and these wolfers convinced themselves that this native tribe was responsible for stealing their horses. And so they end up rolling up on this native tribe that were camped, approximately maybe 40 teepees. And then these wolfers and these Métis freighters opened fire, as you can see in the picture there, on the camp. And they killed quite a few innocent women and children and elderly and men and the rest had to flee off in the middle of winter and so a lot of them died of exposure and the ones that survived managed to make it to friendly tribes who took them in and looked after them well this all happened in 1873 and this tribe was basically almost wiped out by these wolfers and hunters and no one would have known about it except that abel farwell lost all his customers so he made a complaint that made its way back to ottawa and that's when Sir John A. Macdonald and the other parliamentarians realized that there's no law in the British West, which is basically in the Wupa area. So they formed in 1873, the Northwest Mounted Police Force. That's when it was created, 1873. And in the next year in 1874 from Dufferin, Manitoba, the Northwest Mounted Police headed west and they made their way out first into Fort Benton because they kind of got lost. Then they made their way to the Wupup country. So this happened in 1873 and also in 1873, Treaty 3, the Northwest Angle Treaty with the Ojibwa and the Anishinaabe Aski of Northwestern Ontario and Southeastern Manitoba. So by 1873, three number treaties were already completed on the plains. Treaties 1, Treaties 2 and Treaties number 3. So we can see our recap. We had Treaty 3 in 1873. The Northwest Mounted Police Force was created and the Cypress Hills Massacre happened, which was the reason for the Northwest Mounted Police Force being created. Now we go to the year 1874. Now, if you look at this particular map, you can see, as I mentioned, Treaties 1, 2, and 3 were already we're already done. So Treaty 4 was in 1874. So you can see Treaty 4. Well, Treaty 4 was one of those treaties that was agreed upon between the Queen's representatives and at that time, the Blackfoot people's enemy, the Cree people and the Iron Confederacy. So there's been a lot of dis, uh, dispute with the boundaries of Treaty Number 4 and where Treaty 7 is, because the Blackfoot are actually still living on the Saskatchewan, on the elbow of the South Saskatchewan River, 
even after signing a Treaty 7. So the thing is, even during this time of Treaty 4, when they were claiming these lands, the Blackfoot were living on half of those lands, Treaty 4. So the thing is, the Blackfoot never did find Treaty Number 7 fair, because Treaty Number 4 and Treaty Number 6, which were done a few years before the signing of Treaty Number 7, were agreements made between our enemies and the government of Canada. So we've never really appreciated those borders set by Treaty Number 7. Uh, it's a lot bigger, the Blackfoot Territory, in that year, 1874. So those are the different treaties, actually, as you can see, that were around Treaty 7 that affected us, Treaty 6 and Treaty 4. So as I mentioned, the Northwest Mounted Police, they marched west in 1874, leaving Fort Dufferin, Manitoba, and it took them a few months to actually get out to the Whoopup country, where, where they were actually heading to, to put a stop to the whiskey trade. Over here, you can see the route that the Mounties took out to get to the country. So you can see there, the French's route is where the bulk of the Mounties came out to Fort McLeod. Well, before they got to Fort McLeod, they got lost. So they ended up going to Fort Benson in the United States of America, where they picked up a man by the name of Jerry Potts, who in Blackfoot, his name was Gyokosi, Gyokosi, or Bear Child. So he's the one that led the Mounties first to Fort Whoopup, then to Fort McLeod, then to Fort Walsh, and from there, then Fort Calgary, and these end up becoming uh, centers where a lot of people started to gather and started to live around these different uh, different uh, forts, Mountie forts. So French's route took him to Fort Benton, but before then he broke up and there was uh, a group that actually went to Fort Edmonton from Fort Ellis before Regina. But it was French's route that took the Fort Benton and French went back home, back east, and then after French, it wasn't French who went to Fort Whoopup, it was Colonel McLeod who took over the Mounties at that time. And he's the one that led the Mounties into the British possessions when French went back home. So we see that from this picture, the different routes. So over here is another picture of historic old Fort Benton, which was on the Missouri River in the United States of America. And this would have been the center of the whiskey trade. Here's another picture of Fort Benton, and this is uh, uh, how the streets would have looked at, looked like during the whiskey trade. You can see the bull train there, and you can see the different stores. And a lot of these uh, bull trade, our bull traders, are they were uh, outfitted by either of two men, I.G. Baker or T.C. Powers and Brother, our company. These are the two big time outfitters in Fort Benton who would. Uh, basically give the whiskey traders and the wolfers the poison and the fire water and the alcohol and whatever it is they needed to go into Blackfoot country to uh, start trading their wares. So here's another picture. This is Jerry Potts, Gayo Gosi. He's the one that the Mounties picked up in Fort Benton and basically led them to all these different places in Blackfoot country where they set up their, whis uh, set up their, their police forts, I should say. And that was uh, Fort McLeod and Fort Walsh and Fort Calgary. Here's a picture of the old Fort Whoop Up in 1874 near Lethbridge, Alberta. You can see the bas bastion there that the man's uh, looking out from. They had cannon up there and this is how they protected themselves in this fort. And just because of its situation it would have been a very hard fort to try and conquer or overcome. So this is uh, the old Fort Whoop Up and this is actually where the Mounties ended up first. And when they got there, there were no traders or no armies there to fight them as they thought there would be. But there was only one man and his name was Dave Akers. And after that, he basically took over the place and that became his farmstead. But this was in 1874. So at that time, the Mounties realized there were no American whiskey traders up in the Whoopup region when they came through. Now, after they went to Fort Whoopup, Jerry Potts led them to Fort McLeod. So this is what a picture, uh, Fort McLeod looked like in 1874-1875. This is on the Old Man River. This next image is a painting done by uh, uh, Nevitt, who was one of the people, who, the doctor who accompanied the Northwest Mounted Police. Well, here you see the Mounted Police not dressed in their traditional red coats, but in blue coats because they had a, a lack of uh, red coats. So the Mounties basically, here you see them spilling all the liquor that the whiskey traders were bringing into the area. And you can see the natives there, the witnesses, seeing them do this. And basically, this is what um, entrusted the native peoples with the Northwest Mounted Police, particularly the Blackfoot. 
is because when they first came out, the Baku people had already known uniformed white men from the South, the Americans. And we didn't have a good relationship with them, and we didn't trust them either. So that's why a lot of tribes moved into the British possessions. Well, when we met up with the Northwest Mounted Police and the Redcoats, basically our leaders asked them, what are you guys doing out here? And they basically said, we're here for one reason. And this was in the form of Colonel McLeod. He told the Blackfoot chiefs, we're here for one reason and one reason only, and that's to put a stop to the whiskey trade. So at that point, the Blackfoot stood back to see what would happen. And when they watched, they realized that the Mounties were true to their word. Anybody, whether they're red man or white man, that was selling or dealing with uh, breaking the Queen's law, the Mounties arrested and they treated them both the same. And this was a big deal to the Blackfoot speaking peoples because we saw, in a sense, the fairness of their justice compared to the Americans. And we decided we trusted these people. So the Blackfoot leaders put faith in people like Colonel McLeod. They trusted them as men of their word. And so when the Colonel approached the Blackfoot people to talk about treaty, well, at that time, the Blackfoot people were more than willing to listen to him because of who he was. So you could see here the Mounties spelling the spelling, spilling the liquor that they confiscated. And the Native peoples are watching and they see this. And this is one of the reasons why we trusted the Mounted police when they first came out, which happened to change years later. So over here, we see another Mounted police force, and this is in the Cypress Hills. And this wasn't too far from where that Assiniboine tribe was attacked and killed by those wolfers. Well, this was the reason why they put up a fort in the Cypress Hills, was simply to be able to keep uh, the wolfers and whiskey traders away from the native tribes, native peoples that were living in those areas. So over here, we have a picture of Fort Calgary. Now this is Fort Calgary in 1878, about four years later, but that's the same fort. And so this is the fort that the Mounties built just on the confluence of the Elbow and uh, when it meets the Bow River. On the west side of that Elbow River, this is where they built Fort Calgary. And today there's still a spot there you can kind of see the area where the original fort was, even though the original fort itself is gone. But this was Fort Calgary in 1878. And these places all started with the mounted police setting up a house in these different areas. So in 1874, Treaty 4 took place. Sorry? Oh, yeah, 1874. So Treaty, Treaty 4 took place. And as I mentioned, the Treaty 4 boundaries are disputed by the Blackfoot because our people are actually living inside Treaty 4 country at this, at this time, 1874. So as I mentioned, uh, when 1874, when treaties one through four were, were done, there was at no time where the Blackfoot ever consulted. The Blackfoot did not meet with the Queen's representatives until three years later. And by that time, the Queen's representatives and the enemy tribes had already written out the boundaries, boundaries that the Blackfoot never agreed with. So in 1875, well, actually 1874 is where we'll end off this week and hopefully next week we're going to move into 1875 to 1879 and talk a little bit about the Blackfoot history in those days. So with this, I'll kind of leave it open to the floor. We got a couple of minutes. Is there any questions from any of you out there in uh, TV land <laughs> out there? Uh, is there any questions at all that anybody may have at this moment? Well, I've got a few moments to answer. Okay, well, as I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about Blackfoot history next week, and we're gonna try and have for you the, the years 1875 to 1879. But in the meantime, from 1874, I guess this is pretty much the end of our program. Uh, if you have any questions or anybody out there has anything that they would like me to discuss more or elaborate on, please feel free to call Blackfoot Crossing or send us a message, ask a question, and we'll do what we can to accommodate you. Uh, for those of you out there who are tuning in every week, uh, you may find that some of these programs are still are, are the same programs, but we are trying to change that up. And once again, if any of you have any ideas, if there is something that you would like to learn more about from Blackford Crossing Historical Park, please send in your requests and we'll do our best, as I mentioned, to accommodate you. So but with that, I guess I'll leave, uh, leave you to your week. Uh, stay safe. 
everybody remember COVID still out there. Uh, please uh, use your masks and keep yourself safe and keep your children safe. School's just starting again. So uh, um, remember to use a lot of these uh, methods that we're using now to keep ourselves healthy. So use a mask and if you're gonna go into the stores, make sure that uh, you're white washing your hands and doing things because this COVID isn't over yet. And I just wanted to point that out to a lot of you out there. And you know, I imagine you know this already. So anyways, with that, stay safe. And next week, we'll talk a little bit more about Blackfoot history. And until then, Gaita Matsin.